Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Katie Simpson, MD of the Corporate Affairs and Sustainability team at Hanson Search. For those that aren't familiar with Hanson Search, we're a global headhunting company that specializes in communications and marketing across both the consultancy and in-house markets. Before I properly introduce the, the, the panel and the topic today, there's just a couple of housekeeping points I want to cover. We are gonna run for an hour, but I'd like to use the first 30 minutes to speak to the panel to get their thoughts and opinions and advice on the subject. But trying to make this tech platform as interactive as possible, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I will endeavor to cover as many of your questions in the last 30 minutes as possible. Also, there are a number of people who couldn't attend today. So we are actually making a recording of this webinar. So if you'd like a copy, please do get in touch after today's session. If you, if you, Hanson Search run a number of these events, usually live, but at the moment, obviously webinars to address a number of the issues and challenges and also points of interest that our clients come to us and candidates on a regular basis. And this one comes up time and time again. So it's backed by popular demand. So we've joined forces today with our client, global business advisory firm, FTI Consulting, to discuss the ESG trends that have arisen, but also accelerated as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And with, a, with nearly 300 people signed up today, it's clearly a popular topic. Whatever area of business you're in, 2021 is undoubtedly the year of ESG, where companies will become increasingly judged on their environmental, social and governance behavior. You just have to, well, flick through the FT or even the sun, and you'll see how all stakeholders now expect companies to reduce their environmental impact and increase their social impact. So whether companies are defining their purpose or simply restating it, the COVID crisis has certainly highlighted the relevance of ESG considerations on both company performance and investment returns. But the last 12 months have also thrown up a number of questions. If we can drastically change our behavior to fight a viral pandemic, can we also do so to fight climate change? Or will we simply now be focused on getting food on the table and getting through a looming recession? We've got a panel of four experts today and they are well-versed on this topic. So to kick off ladies, I'll just go through and introduce the panel. Firstly, we have Helen Novitska, Helen is FTI Consulting's UK Head of Sustainability and a member of FTI's global ESG leadership team. At FTI, she counsels clients on ESG reporting and sustainability strategy development. Helen has a long-standing consultancy career that spans Washington DC, New York and London. And in her spare time, she's currently studying an MSc in Environment Assist and Sustainability at Birkbeck College. We then have Charlotte Cranny, Charlotte originally co-ran the Sustainable Finance Network, the social network for sustainable finance industry leaders and stakeholders. And before recently joining Volans, a London-based change agency as their marketing and communications lead, Claudine was director of communications at the UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association. Claudine Blamey, Claudine is head of sustainability and digital strategy at UK property developer Argent. Claude, prior to this, Claudine has held many corporate responsibility roles at the likes of Sainsbury's, the Crown Estate, British Land, Honda, and EasyJet. And she was also the former chair of the Institute for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability. And last but not least, we have Betsy Reed. Betsy lives, eats, and breathes the topic and has done for the last 17 years. She, before starting her own consultancy where she advises clients across UK, Europe, and the US, she held sustainability and comms roles at the likes of Zero Waste Scotland, Nestle, and she led the sustainability team at Global Agency Grayling. Welcome, ladies. Helen, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Can you give us an overview of the ESG trends that you have seen over the last 12 months, and specifically what FTI has been seeing as the key drivers of those? Absolutely. Thanks, Katie. And uh, good morning to everybody. And, uh, and thanks to uh, everybody for coming this morning. And what a great panel. I'm very excited to be a part of it. Um, yeah, I think it's helpful to think about ESG trends that we're seeing in, in a few ways, because without doubt, 
the uniting driver around the greater focus on ESG that we're seeing is, is COVID-19. Uh, that's been a huge factor in uh, increasing both companies and investors focus on their ESG strategies. At a high level, we've seen calls for businesses to build back better. We've seen the World Economic Forum calling for a great reset. Um, and, you know, at a company level, amidst this terrible um, global pandemic, we're also seeing them being scrutinized uh, for making sure that they protect the personal safety of staff, uh, access to PPE, looking after people as through the through the economic uh, challenges of the last 12 months. Um, but I think that there's also been a, a, a kind of um, a co combination of, of COVID coming at a time when ESG was already very much in the spotlight. Um, and there's been drivers from a multiple uh, range of sources, which has really created this big inflection point that we're seeing. So I, I think they really break into um, three different areas. There's ESG overall and the kind of specific tre trends within environment, social and governance. There's also the role of financial regulation and then the, the perspective of investors. So I'll, I'll just cover each of those in a little bit of detail. From, from the broad ESG perspective, I think the big trend has been around the uh, environment, particularly around climate change. Um, that's been a huge topic in the last two to three years, particularly since the uh, signing of the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, so if you take the UK as an example, we've committed to being a net zero country by 2050. That's triggered other legislation. So, for example, the uh, ending of the sale of cars with petrol engines from 2030. And that's in turn driven changes in business behavior with major manufacturers like Nissan and Jaguar uh, increasing their focus on uh, electric, electric vehicles and the relative components for them. Um, at a kind of global level, we're hosting COP26 in, in November, and that has, I think, triggered the government to look to business to support its net zero mission through things like the race to zero. Um, and also through other, other factors such as uh, changes in, in financial reporting, which I'll come on to uh, in a moment. Then if we look at the S of ESG, the social aspect, I think social justice in its broader sense has really become front and center in, in the last year, um, particularly with the rise of civil society movements like Black Lives Matter, uh, in the UK uh, following the death of George Floyd last May. And, and that coupled with Me Too has really driven a more focused conversation around diversity, inclusion and belonging within, within business. And then the G of governance um, has, has long been a, a kind of topic for consideration, but particularly I think with uh, topics like such as boardroom and executive pay awards, that was already under scrutiny from activist shareholders. But with the, with the pandemic, that's even more true because with, with COVID, it's not a good look to award your CEO a major bonus while you're putting people out on, on furlough. So then if we think about the, the second topic of financial regulation, I think one big trend we've really heard a lot about is um, the, the change that's coming through the requirement for companies to report under the Task Force for, for Climate Related Financial Disclosure or TCFD, which is an acronym I'm sure everybody's been hearing a lot about on, on, on the panel and in the audience, um, because it requires businesses to really engage strategically with the issues raised by climate change. So this isn't just about reporting your emissions, it's actually how you as a business are thinking about climate, both from a, a governance perspective, a strategic perspective, risk management, and also from metrics and targets that you're going to put in place to think about um, how you implement uh, me necessary measures within your company. And it became a requirement for large list of businesses for the financial year starting January the 1st. So um, it's being rolled out more broadly across uh, other financial services sector that's in discussion. Um, but you know, companies are really now having to think about climate change as intrinsic to their business, which is, which is important. And then just briefly on the investor perspective, which I think is a third critical area here, without doubt, companies are being asked more questions around their approach to ESG. Uh, and the desire really that investors have is more transparency. So, you know, we've heard Black Rock's Larry Fink, Larry Fink talking about this and uh, very much focusing on areas like TCFD uh, and general disclosure. Um, but we at FTI are seeing that too. We did a survey among 260 institutional investors to contrast their opinions between um, over a six-month period before start the start of COVID and, and more recently. 
And um, there was a big upturn in the number who are now looking for more information from companies about their sustainability strategies. Uh, in fact, three quarters of investors or 74% are now looking for that. And that was an increase of 11% in just six months. And additionally, investors are saying that uh, almost universally, 99% of investors are saying that a high ESG rating will increase corporate value. So that in turn is driving businesses to think more about how they focus on, on ESG and uh, pay more attention to their ESG performance. So I think they're the, really the three big drivers that we're, we're seeing in action at the moment. Fantastic, thanks Helen. Charlene, building on that, um, the same question really, what trends have you been seeing? And to, you know, mm -hmm. to add on to what Helen was saying, the effect that COVID ha has had on these investor trends as well. Yeah, so I've been working at the heart of UK sustainable finance for the last seven to eight years. And the last couple of years have seen unbelievable progress, far beyond what I ever imagined when I um, back when I started. But I'm, what I'm going to do is cover just five trends or features that I'm seeing at the moment that are really significant. Um, and the first one is acknowledgement that essential feature of sustainable investment is that it does better than non-sustainable strategies during economic wobbles or volatility. So Morgan Stanley, they compared the performance of sustainable and non-sustainable funds from 2004 to 2018. So that's 14 years. And they found no significant total returns difference, but they did find that sustainable funds outperform when the market is unpredictable. Um, and it happened again during the pandemic. So now we have a pretty reliable fundamental feature of sustainable investing. It's, it's a good choice during uncertain times. The next trend that um, has come up is um, around double materiality. Uh, so in the, e in the EU, there's new regulation pushing for double materiality, which is the requirement to report on both financial and sustainability outcomes. So that's from this month. Um, so that's it in the EU, but multinational companies is gonna push for something similar in the UK so that they don't have to do lots of different styles of reporting, which gets expensive across the di different jurisdictions and they're already doing it, so why not? Um, and now global reporting standard setters are looking at this too. Um, Helen mentioned TCFD, but something else happening in the UK on standards is that the British Standards Institute is actually seeking to clarify the difference between ESG and sustainable investing, because what people don't realise is actually investing in um, companies that score a bit higher on, on ESG, showing that they're kind of less bad than the others, that doesn't actually cause change, that doesn't actually create any change. And it does sometimes give the investors the impression that it does. To, to actually inspire change, you need to um, be speaking to companies, you need the stewardship part, you need to speak to companies, you need to vote at AGMs on you know, different behaviors that you want to see um, changed. Um, so, so yeah, the BSI is actually clarifying that and making sure that will make sure that investors use the, right, use the right terms in future. So the next big trend is net zero. So we've got the UN Race to Zero, which is a global campaign to seek net zero emissions commitments from economies. And it's gathering pace. There are thousands of new commitments coming from right across economies from big to small companies, um, from local governments um, to national governments. And it's right across the finance industry as well. We're seeing commitments coming from banks and fund managers and pension funds. Um, so they are rolling in. Um, even China has a net zero commitment, albeit too late. Um, they're committing to net zero by 2060. Um, so hopefully they move that forward. But uh, there are a lot of the industry that still dragging their feet and this campaign has been going for nearly two years now so you know what we're going to see is that a net zero commitment is going to be the minimum standard um, for anyone that's seeking to do business with an investment firm or a financial services firm um, who claim to care about climate change so that's something to look 
to look out for. If they haven't made a commitment by COP26 this year, then they can't be as serious about climate change as their brochure might claim. The next trend is around race and gender. Um, I mean, this is a trend that's just been ongoing, but it found new life um, during the pandemic. We know companies do better when they're diverse. That is a well-reported outcome. There's plenty of research to show that. But we have to also remember that companies and, and investors are, are humans. And a lot of people, particularly white people in privileged positions, really woke up to the inequalities around race. Um, and so there's been a lot of a lot more action um, across the investment industry. So one example for that um, of that is legal in general. They wrote to the bosses of the FTSE 100 and the S&P 500 saying it expects their boardrooms to include at least one black Asian or other person of color by January 2022, else it will vote against boards at AGM, AGMs. Um, so that's really a bit of investor activism there. And another easy win would be to ensure that companies report on the race pay gap as they do on the gender pay gap. That will really help investors better manage racial financial exclusion and inequality. And the final trend that I want to share is a big movement around regeneration. This is going to be the new sort of buzzword. You know, it started out as responsible investment and then sustainable investment. And we've had the ESG. And I think what we're going to see in the future is a lot of talk around regeneration. So regenerative capitalism, regenerative economics and regenerative investment. And that is really about the active regeneration of the natural capital we use for production. So putting trees back and regenerating species of overfarmed fish or even communities that have been victim to some corporate abuse or scandal. Because um, to be less bad than the others is no longer going to cut it. And the future of this type of investment, investors and activists increasingly want to see people being more good. So... So yeah, look out for regenerative investment. Thanks, Charlene. Claudine, we'll come to you next. Um, Claudine, you've you've done this for years across lots of different sectors, and you know at the moment you're currently in um, you know a UK property developer, and and the property and construction industry is one of the harder industries to decarbonise, and that presents its own set of challenges. What are you finding across the piece? Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I um. I like to take a slightly different perspective on it and don't want to repeat all the um, fantastic trends my co-panelists uh, have talked about. So, so I'm going to take a sort of placemaking um, element to this. And, and health and well-being has been completely and utterly on the radar. Not that it wasn't before, but I think the way people want to work has been both crystallized and enabled through COVID. It's been crystallized in that people are voting uh, with surveys all over the place saying, we don't want to be in the office more than two, three days a week. And they want to take their life back. People want a balance in their life. And to be able to do that, um, I suppose employers have to have to react and and they have been and i'll talk about a little bit about that in a moment and then there's been this massive enabler and that enabler has been through tech you know we can work from home we can talk to each other we can run webinars we can do every all the all those sorts of things and presenteeism is just completely gone out the window so that element of health and well-being is a big trend Therefore, employers are reacting to that if they want talent, if they want people working for them um, from, from across the world, they need to be able to accommodate that. Um, and therefore, there are all these sort of dynamic working policies coming out, flexible working policies coming out of, of employers. And I can guarantee that people will not be going back five days a week into a space to just sit down and do their work there'll be different activities going on in those spaces and therefore those spaces are being reconfigured um, and actually whole of my sectors 
you know, kind of up in the air a little bit in terms of, so what's going to happen, what's going on. The other area um, that I think has been really highlighted is around um, localism and localization. We went through a couple of decades of, of globalization. Everything was globalized. Everything was um, centralized, if you like. It's now coming down to localism. People want local things. People want to be part of a community. They want a sense of belonging. They want to see craft happening in their local area. They want to support their local businesses. And this whole idea of 15 minute city is, is really flourishing and people are really thinking about that. And the next sort of area I want to talk about is um, social mobility. I think we're going to see a um, hell of a lot of unemployment. Um, we're already starting to see that. We're going to see a lot of homelessness that increasing. It was increasing before COVID. It's going to be dramatically increasing going forward. Children are going to be um, really impacted in the sense that they've now had a year and a half of kind of strange schooling. Those who haven't had access to digital technology, they haven't had computers, afford, they're going to fall more behind those that, that did. Um, so how, how are we going to bridge that gap? Is that gap ever going to bridge? And I know there's a lot of conversations going on around this. And what's the impact of that down the line in terms of our economy, the skills we're going to need? And what new jobs are we going to bring into the economy that are going to put these people into employment? And actually, this is where sustainability comes into its own, because we need a lot of new skills new talent to drive a circular economy, a zero carbon economy. It's not the same old roles. So this is an interesting space and a and real transition going on around um, social mobility that we need to think about. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about a, a bit of a negative impact that I think COVID has had on sustainability and that's around waste. Um, a lot of single use stuffs come back in when we were changing people's behavior around having your own cup and, and stuff. Now you can't take your own cup to a coffee shop, not well, most coffee shops and get a, get a coffee because of COVID. How are we gonna go back to um, changing that behavior again and not having all this plastic going back into the system, which is very, very sad. That's all from me. Thanks, Claudine. Betsy, coming on to you, what's your take on the topic? Well, I love going last because you all have covered the trends so absolutely well. Um, can everybody hear me? I just, something popped up about no sound. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I get to talk about my favorite topic, which is about how all of these trends have come together to influence the kind of leadership that's needed. And some are really taking up the mantle and also, this, this growing expectation that organizations will be purpose-driven, which of course is reflected in their ESG reporting and their ESG strategy in general. So, you know, thinking through these trends about, I mean, back in 2018, the, the Edelman Trust Barometer talked about CEOs who are silent on social and environmental issues. Is, it's a deeply dangerous thing to their business. So talking about how this model of leadership that's built on these trends we've talked about is actually the one that people will want to invest in. And Charlene referred to that quite neatly about the legal and general action. And that's just gonna become more widespread. So can a leader be trusted? Can they make decisions based on the current reality and also an understanding of the future? It's no longer okay to go with your 10 or 20 year old business school education and the trends you learned. You have to be really aware of and empathetic and able to read the room on a really grand scale and see how issues like climate change and Me Too and Black Lives Matter and whatever movements are growing next are coming because there is the additional factor of leadership without a capital L, you know, with people working from home, people wanting more and more to align their personal with their professional values, people able to go on social media and be activists, people who never thought they would be activists. There is a growing, I would say, positive groundswell of personal leadership and people who want to be leaders in their own lives, leaders in their communities, leaders in their organizations. And they're going to expect to see this in their leaders. 
And Brene Brown, who most of you probably know, says something along the lines of who we are is how we lead. And so that is going to be reflected in what people who are employers, who are middle managers expect of themselves, but also expect of leaders at the top. So what are those leaders going to do about things about, you know, falling fossil fuel production, uh, increasing producer responsibility on issues like packaging that's come off the back of real attention to things like ocean plastics? Um, how will an understanding of diversity and inclusion, which is just a big term, going to be reflected, not just because they're required to have one person of color on their board by January 2022, but because they genuinely understand that unlocking a large segment of society is going to be more productive for them in the long run, and that they're actually missing out on resource if they're not paying attention to this. So how are they going to take on that mantle and put on those new lenses that they're being asked to put on? Because, I mean, let's face it, the majority of makeup of leadership is still a certain demographic. It looks a certain way. It's a certain color. It's probably a certain gender. So it's an extra challenge for them to take this on as something that relates to them because it would be easy to sail along in relative ease, just continuing to do things the way that things have been done. But some of the language that, because I'm a communications person and a lot of what I do, and, and I actually tutor a course for the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership called Communicating for Impact and Influence. So we have a lot of meaty discussions in those fora, which are made up of around, per course, 120 professionals from around the world, many of whom are quite seasoned leaders. And we're ha having these discussions about how do you address these issues? How do you communicate these issues? Because let's not forget, a key part of leadership is about communications and about how you express authenticity and transparency, which the whole aim of ESG reporting is about really transparency, shining a light on how companies are dealing with environmental social issues. So I think communications and leaders who do it well is going to become a dividing factor between leaders who are good leaders and people want to invest in and people who are totally dropping the ball. So you can't fail to be a good communicator as a leader these days. And that's something that is a critical, it's been seen as a soft skill for so long. And I've never understood that because it's actually critical to trust, to building your reputation, to gaining loyalty from employees, to attracting employees and retaining them. And obviously we haven't really touched on demographic trends, but you know, millennials, we're now leaders anyway, but Gen Z and below have even higher expectations of what their brands, their employers, their government are going to do for them and how they're going to align with their values, which are more focused on environmental and social issues. So the tsunami is headed our way and those who aren't prepared to communicate well about it are going to be dead. <laughs> Let's just face it. I have a a collaborator that I work quite closely with who has just developed this beautiful metaphor for explaining all of this, how economy, society, and the environment fit together. So if you think of the skeleton, the human body, think of the skeleton as the economy. You can break a bone and still probably get on with life. It'll be uncomfortable, but you get on with it. But then society is the guts and the muscles. It's the everything. It's the thing that keeps your body functioning. It's the thing that that detoxes you. It's the thing that allows you to be able to continue walking even on a broken bone. So that's the, the important part for all of this consideration. We're not just talking about ESG. Let's remember it's about environment and society and governance and society is a good term to remember because then if you think of the skin as the environment, you can scratch it, you can burn it, you can still function as long as society is working. But then at a certain point when you have done enough damage to that skin, to that environment, it starts to affect everything and you can't hold it together any longer. So just remembering the beauty of how this all fits together and the importance of leadership is kind of what I want to leave people with, but also the memory of what I said about leadership being everyone. You know, in this age of social media, this age of working from home, leadership, everyone has power, possibly that they don't even remember. Relational power, network power, actual positional power, perhaps. But that's something to keep in mind, even for leaders at the top, is that you're dealing with people who are starting to see their own power more and more. And that's going to have an impact on activist investors, on employers, on absolutely everything. So being human at work, having a culture that allows people to be leaders and leaders who are seeking to align their personal values, their employer's personal values with their strategy and their ESG strategy and reporting is going to be absolutely critical. 
Thank you, Betsy. I'm just going to, before I float, throw it out to the floor for questions, so please, um, to the audience, please do send, keep sending in your questions. I can see some coming through right now. Just a couple more questions from me. Um, Helen, back to you. As I mentioned, you know, it's not just a consequence of COVID. This has been years in the, in the making. But now defining or restating or tweaking their uh, purpose strategies. But there will be organisations that are seen as jumping on the bandwagon and purpose washing, green washing, all these words that we, we've seen used. How can this be avoided, Helen? Well, that's a great question. I think that the, the route to do that is really by making sure that companies are very thoughtful in how they uh, approach this and often we we talk to clients about the need to really um, you know start with with really uh, finding that alignment between them as a business and then their their, their, their the, the the material issues that are most important to them from a sustainability or ESG standpoint um, and I think that you know it's it's critical that businesses are really clear on what the what the topics are and the issues are that they they are most um, able to um, align with their with their business, but also to be very transparent about the journey that they're on. So there will be organisations that perhaps are taking their first steps into ESG and sustainability. And so, you know, they won't have all the answers. They won't necessarily have all the systems in place or, the, or have all of the right um, things that they might have if they were a bit more uh, further along their journey. So, you know, our guidance is to be very transparent about that and just explain where, if there are gaps, what the business is doing to address those. Um, and I think that that is actually typically something that investors want to, to see so that they can return in a year's time to see what progress has been made. Um, so yeah, I think not over, over claiming or over, over promising is really important, but being able to have a, have a clear strategy and then explain how you're going to, to deliver on that strategy um, tends to put companies in, in, in good stead. Fantastic. I'm conscious that we're losing Claudine at quarter past nine. Um, Claudine, there's a question come in specifically for you. So I'm going to I'm going to go to the questions now and cover as many of them as we can. Just to read this one out, Claudine, interesting points about the future of working from home. I believe the impact of this trend should not be underestimated. Interestingly enough, there are generational differences in preferences for working from home. It's the Gen Xs who are most in favour of working from home full time whereas the millennials and Gen Z are more favorable to hybrid models, i.e. approximately two days per week. That means company cultures, employer brands, leadership style and capability will change dramatically. But most importantly, I believe we have a unique opportunity to not just implement working from home, which is fairly restrictive, but redefine the workplace and the relationship between employers and employees. Working from home shouldn't be seen as escaping oppressive office environments or fear of taking public transportation to get to work. Do you agree with that, Claudine? Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, that there's definitely differences in, in the generations. Um, you know, my, my, my daughter's 10. She's a, a gen, gen X, I guess. And she, um, she, she didn't want to go to school. Um, she much prefers sitting at home and doing stuff on Zoom. She'd much rather do that full time at home. And I can see um, that generation being totally different. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. And it, it isn't about, you know, escaping something. I think it's about healthy kind of balance in your life um, and the ability now to be able to do that. And that's that's the important thing. And, and also, I mean, we were getting to a point where everyone was cramming into our transport systems all at the same time, putting lots and lots of pressure on the transport, create, you know, for the transport sector to spend more money in order to put more trains on and, and, and you know, it just goes on and on and on. So can we can we actually save money on that, on, on our transport systems? Can we use that money for, for other health and well-being um, elements in our, in our um, society, like having every child with a computer, for example? Uh, and, and therefore, this does, as I said before, really transform the way we think, the way we work, the way we, we function as a society completely. Just that fact that you won't have to have rush hour anymore could have a massive impact um, on, on everything that we do.
Fantastic, thank you. Um, another question that's come in, Charlene, maybe one for you, but please do, um, you know, panel just jump in where, where see, you see fit. How do we provide investors more confidence that ESG measurement is standardized and robust? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a tricky one because um, there is no pure definition of what ESG means. A lot of investors use ESG for lots of different related strategies. So there might be an ESG fund that excludes tobacco and arms, and that's all that they've done, but they're calling it ESG and not doing the proper full analysis. Um, so it is tricky. So the first you know, way to go is to uh, set those definitions so people know what we mean by ESG. And the Investment Association is actually working on definitions for ESG, responsible, impact, sustainable, so that investors can actually tell the difference. And in terms of how companies are rated, I mean, we do have, a, you know, a few different research and rating companies and they have different methodologies so it's really up to the fund manager to be really clear about the methodology that they use um, so that the investors know what those ratings mean um, so yeah there isn't this kind of standardized kind of central definition or rating system it is all over the place at the moment but it is starting to come together particularly in the eu so i think things will change fantastic getting some meaty questions coming in keeping me on my toes mm -hmm. so i'll throw this on out to all of you chinese home builder excuse me if i pronounce this wrong Sizen. It's been nine months since the company's chairman was imprisoned for child abuse and big ESG investors like BlackRock, PIMCO and Fidelity apparently still own bonds in the company. Reuters asks, is ESG just lip service? What do you think? Who would like to take that one first? I mean, I, I can take it quickly. Um, as it's an investment question, uh, there's two things that could be going on here. Even with, with the conviction, they could still have a high ESG score compared to other companies in that industry. So that's probably why they're still seen as an ESG investment. And the second thing is, we don't know what those investors are doing. They could actually be engaging with that company and asking them how they're making sure they have policies or changing behaviors to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. And you can only have those conversations if you're invested in the company. So I don't know exactly what's happening, but those are two um, ideas. Thank you. Another question. Has the panel recently witnessed a greater alignment of corporate ESG policies with the UN strategic development goals? Um, I can take that quickly. I, th I think Unilever have done a great job of that. Um, they started quite a while ago, um, but they've really carried on on that journey. And, and I find their reporting really, really fantastic as well. Yeah, I think that the, the UN SDGs have uh, definitely uh, become more factored into companies' overall ESG and sustainability strategies. Um, and I think one thing that uh, we, in some cases we're seeing is a move away from companies trying to support all 17 to maybe picking three or four, which is more aligned with their business, which I think is, you know, it, it, it's kind of tangible then. It becomes more, more something that a business can really get behind. Um, and that goes back to that idea of, you know, materiality and taking the topics that are, that are most important to you. But also it allows then for targets to be set. And that's a really important part of, of a company being able to show its, its ESG progress. So if you, if you choose um, a, a, an SDG uh, and you align it with your, your overall sustainability approach and you put some, some targets in place of what you're going to deliver in, in three or five or 10 years, then that actually makes it feel very, very um, tangible and not um, just a kind of theory, but actually something practical that you can then also pull right through the business and help people in the organization get behind, help your supply chain get behind. Because again, I think that's another uh, question that we're increasingly starting to, to hear about from investors um, and indeed from, from, from others as well. But 
you know, building relationships between businesses and their supply chains or, or with it with civil society groups and using those coalitions or those, those kind of convening moments to, to help drive a, a more positive agenda. Fantastic. Betsy, one for you. As a layman, is there an order in which to tackle the E, the S and the G? Yes and no. <laughs> Obviously, I, I, I would say social is the most important and environment has been the one that everybody sort of tried to tackle first because it's the low hanging fruit and sort of easy to sort out your office recycling. Um, it depends on the organization because it really is about how can you start in a way that actually sets momentum going. So I would say the most important would probably be social because it's been easy to ignore. You know, economic, obviously you have to, you have to reflect it in your p &L, you have to report it in, to your, to your uh, well, everybody, everybody wants a good economic, a good profit report. Um, but yeah, I would say, this is my challenge, try to tackle social first, if possible, or weave it into other things that you're doing, because often I've seen so many times, and I'm sure the panel will agree, People do environment and then stop. They think, oh, we do sustainability. And it means you you have a biodiversity policy or <clears throat> you've talked about circular economy or whatever. But I would say the time has come to pay attention to social. And I think now is the perfect storm, the perfect context for it. I just add to that as well, Katie. I think, um, don't forget they're all interconnected. They're not separate things. Um, you know, we, we live in a world of systems and systems are inevitably interconnected. and you know, you could you could enhance your biodiversity in a and create a park, and actually that park has mental health well-being uh, properties. It's it brings people together. Um, it's a place where where yeah pe people come together and and create that social value as well. So yeah, you, you must never separate them completely. Is my advice as well. Fantastic. Do you believe that there is a risk of backlash against diversity and inclusion policies? For example, not everybody believes that mandatory race and gender targets in boards is the right way to deal with an issue. Have any of you seen this backlash? No? No, I, ha I haven't seen that sort of backlash at all. I think, you know, some people are worried about the distinction or get upset about the distinction between um, a quality of um, a quality of outcomes rather than a quality of opportunity. So I think it's the equality of opportunity piece that um, people want to see more focus on. Um, but yeah, there hasn't been any backlash at all, not from my, my perspective. Good, okay. Thinking specifically about tech business, how important is ESG for tech the conversation seems to be completely missing in the startup space, despite significant investor interest. Does anyone have any experience of the tech businesses? I, I can speak a, a little bit to, to it. I mean, I think that um, that uh, from a from a technology industry point of view, um, you know, one of the big areas that's certainly rising to the fore is is that well the E and the S really, because the E is particularly uh, a consideration for businesses where, you know, there's a heavy use of, of um, electricity to power big data centers and, and uh, big, big uh, processing power. So for instance, I think there was a story even last week about Bitcoin and uh, the, the kind of massive use of electricity that it was triggering and kind of creating an, an ESG issue for, for, um, for investors because of that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, so I think that that's an area where maybe businesses are starting to, to become more aware of their of their responsibilities. And, um, you know, there's, that's that's an interesting play. But I think on the S side, yes, I think that, again, you know, there's been a number of issues, haven't there, with different businesses um, looking at the, the health and well-being of employees. Um, so I think I think. It, you know, as with with many industry sectors, perhaps these issues are starting to come to the to the fore more uh, and become a greater a greater focus area. I think with startups, it generally, perhaps there's a case that you know the priorities is um, are, are more um, just in the day to day economics rather than the kind of bigger picture. Now, I'm not saying that's right, but um, 
and inc I think increasingly, you know, you are seeing value driven businesses arise as well, uh, or ones that have sustainability baked in from the start, but perhaps in the startup sector, there's a, in, in tech, there's a maybe a, di a slightly different heritage that's informed that that world so far. So perhaps the, the ESG aspect hasn't always been front and center. So um, hopefully that will, that will start to change and indeed may change as companies that are starting up are starting to look at more uh, pur purpose-driven missions. So around areas like, for instance, um, carbon capture and storage. I know there's some really interesting startups in that space, which is again, very aligned with, with the broader um, ESG and sustainability agenda. So yeah, one, one to watch, I guess. Definitely. Can I jump in actually? Because I've worked, I've worked with quite a few tech startups and actually I live in Barcelona. So I have a lot of friends who are tech entrepreneurs. Um, and what surprised me is actually my assumption that a lot of tech startups are very purpose driven and the fact that that's not necessarily true and that, you know, tech startups tend to be driven by very visionary founders or people who are very technically gifted and, and they're focused on one thing. And so trying to introduce um, a social or environmental impact idea into that, to me, seems obvious. You know, a lot of these things are really seeking to improve society or the way people do things or have actually end up having a greater positive impact on the environment or whatever, because they're more efficient. But they're often so technically focused on their idea and their one thing that it's actually hard to get them to consider the wider context. So I think that that's a conversation worth continuing to have in the tech world, because there's a lot of tech for good, but I think the people who don't see themselves in that space just don't even consider it. They're like, I'm just here to make money and sell my startup in five years and retire at 35. So it's it's definitely a factor. And I think it's one to watch because these these can be innovations that make or break the systems we're setting up to get us into the future or not. So it's a really, really good question. Thank you. Here's a big one. Thinking back to when gender pay gaps were first required to be reported a couple of years ago, there seemed to be an inherent understanding in the community reviewing the facts and figures that we need, needed to allow each business to space to report their current situation with the understanding that the goal was to provide the base facts and then work from to improve their gender pay gap. What can we provide, how, sorry, how can we provide the framework for ESG reporting so that we're not discouraging businesses from reporting or overspinning their reporting for fear of a knee jerk reaction? Who'd like to take that one? Um, I can have a quick go at that one. Um, yeah, totally get that, agree. Um, I think, what investors, the asset owners really want to see is effort and the intention to improve businesses. So for example, with the net zero commitments that we're seeing being made, um, we're not expecting these large companies to be net zero today or tomorrow. What we're asking for are some you know, targets that they can reach, measure and reach um, with the kind of big goal of becoming net zero. And so that's what we should look for um, and put into our ESG reporting. Where do you want to get to? How are you doing on that journey? Um, how are you measuring that? Um, yeah, that's the way to do it, I would say. Fantastic. Betsy, you mentioned earlier the importance of leadership getting it right. So it filters down from the top. Are there any particular trends that you're seeing in recruitment and retention and really overall performance of companies that have leaders that really buy into and truly let people be human and bring their values to work? Oh my gosh. Oh, let's see. There, okay, there have been some good ones. I'm just thinking of who I can name check here. I think actually COVID has brought out the best of some and shown how some people have been taking extraordinary care of their employees. And it's also brought out the worst in some, and I will not name check here, of how they have been exploiting their employees or completely failing to understand what their lives are like in this pandemic. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to begin to answer that question. You could write a book on this. But I think, um, yeah, the those who have done it well are those who have been really transparent about, I'm human too also who've been transparent about maybe we won't get it right. And this goes for all 
ESG strategy and reporting and everything. And, and Unilever has already been raised as a fantastic example of this. The conversation wouldn't be complete unless we talked about Unilever at some point. <laughs> but they have always talked about how they're on a journey. And the thing is, they are genuinely on a journey. And that's evident. Those who talk about being on a journey and don't seem to be moving anywhere are not terribly believable. So I think those leaders who people do trust are those who can admit when they haven't gotten it right. I used to work for Nestle and they're not terrific about admitting when they haven't gotten it right. And it has continued to follow them as a reputational risk. Whereas their main rival Unilever are the shiny example of transparency and admitting it when you get it wrong, building currency and loyalty. So I think those are, I'll leave it at that. No more name checking, but yeah, I think it's authenticity, really transparency. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more question. How do businesses effectively differentiate themselves with their communications from competitors and wider ecosystem with so many frameworks and disclosures available and the multitude of initiatives which are available, mainly around climate? Yeah, I, I can try and take that one. I think that the answer comes back to really having a strong understanding of what it is that the business wants to um, stand for in terms of its approach to ESG and sustainability. And it's right to say, as we've discussed, there are many, many frameworks out there. Um, you know, there, there are, def therefore, it, it's important for business to really know what its position is and then it articulate that through the various frameworks and, and uh, reporting approaches. Um, and that takes a bit of work, you know, it's a kind of upfront uh, commitment to, to really take a look at strategy, to, to, to do that hard thinking, and also importantly to get the, the business internally ar aligned around the goals, because if that doesn't happen, then the, the actions needed to deliver the strategy won't happen. Um, so I think that that can, that can really bring differentiation because if a business is clear on, on what it does and what, what it's not just on sustainability, but it's broader purpose, then that naturally comes through in its communications uh, approach. Fantastic. Ladies, just coming on to um, each of you, actually, um, in terms of a piece of advice, what advice would you give to corporates to effectively evolve their ESG approach? Helen, sorry, we'll, st we'll go off with you again, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that the importance of setting targets is, is really vital because what, what, uh, you know, what matters gets measured. And so if you have a kind of stake in the ground to say we're going to aim for a task or a, a deliverable by a certain period of time, and this is how we're going to get there. And that's agreed, you know, at the senior level, then it actually feeds through the business. So I think you know setting targets and and um, and and, and I, I'm actually going to have two and say you know the importance of transparency as well because being able to you know be comfortable in in uh, in having that kind of uh, approach to to telling people what you're doing is is really important too. Thank you, Charlene. Advice. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's three things I would say. The first is to invest in the data. Um, it's so important. Um, make sure you've got it, accept it as a cost of business to do ESG while you really need the data. The second thing I would say is have a look at stewardship, have a look at how you're engaging with the companies that you're investing in, even if you're doing it through third parties, um, because there is definitely a shift towards outcomes, um, not just the kind of risk management side of things. Um, and I had a last one, but I can't remember. Oh, a very key one for this audience is get better at communications. You know, people want to see your story and want to see you doing well at this stuff. Um, and so just think about how you're communicating, look to other industries, use digital, be more human, all of those things. Um, people want to cheer you on in this journey. Let's see. I feel like I'm going to carry Claudine into this with me. Um, <laughs> I'd say the first thing is I've got, well, I'll keep it to two, but the first thing is <laughs> affix this lens that everything is connected. It is an ecosystem, social, environmental governance, you know, the, the economy, it's all intertwined. You can't separate them. So challenge yourself to continually remind yourself of that perspective when you're making decisions, you know, great environment. It's easy to do, but what about the social impact? And then second is 
start with what you know you can do well, because that will gain traction internally and currency, and then strive for the things that you know you can't do as well. And, you know, aim for the stars because it's times are desperate. There is no longer an opportunity to just coast on this stuff. Everybody needs to be doing their best or they will not exist as businesses in 10 years and the rest of us won't exist in 50. So yeah. aim for the stars. And also then I echo Charlene's points about communicate it. People are more on side than you think. And there's a lot of fear about backlash. There's a lot of fear about being transparent, but actually there's no place to hide anymore. So just learn to do it as well as possible. And this, you know, Helen, the question for you, this obviously applies to certain industries, which will be, you know, the, uh, the notoriously harder to pull out from this. So we mentioned property and construction at the beginning um, with Claudine, but energy, for example, um, a big tide to turn. Can they turn their reputation around now? Or is it a little too little too late? Well, I think there's some uh, very interesting work that's coming out of some of the big energy majors, isn't there? Um, and I think, you know, we can look at what BP has been trying to do uh, in terms of, you know, very strategically pivoting in a different way away from fossil fuels and setting itself some very clear targets. And, you know, it's no surprise to me that that came with the appointment of a new CEO. So I think the, you know, that there's clearly a linkage there between leadership and the business uh, direction of travel. So I think it comes back to leadership, you know, if, if there's a genuine desire to um, change how the business functions, then that will, that, will, that will move the business with it and reputation will, will follow. Great. Um, a final point today, um, everyone. A number of the attendees did ask me when I was sending out invites for this, uh, just some examples of case studies of companies that got it right. Probably best to stay on this side rather than the ones that have got it wrong. I know that we've mentioned a, a couple of large global FMCGs there, but any others that you feel have really hit the spot over the last 12 months and, and probably before then, again, defining, tweaking and restating strategies, purpose and ESG strategies. Betsy. Oh, Helen, yeah. No, no, you go, go for it, Betsy. I have, yeah, no, I'm going first to for a change here. I actually have a favorite and that's Chipotle because it's actually a brand that a lot of people love. And over the years, they've done a lot about highlighting their supply chain and how they, you know, source meat ethically and things like that. But they've really upped their game. Um, so they're focusing on racial equality and gender pay, but they're also really making an effort to support more sustainable small farms. And they've actually like really pushed up their targets quite, mm, quite drastically. And this actually just came out earlier, no, nah, last week, actually, news of this tied to their ESG strategy and reporting. So yeah, check out Chipotle. They're an interesting brand because obviously they've had some rough economic times, but they're still really aiming to do better on this. Thank you. Helen. I was going to mention um, AstraZeneca just because I think that they've done a very good job over a number of years of really being very thoughtful and and to Charlene's point, you know, really investing in the data around their, their ESG reporting. So they have a, a very detailed strategy around their their approach to sustainability and ESG. And they, they've really gone deep on uh, setting long-term targets and they're very, um, very, very much implementing that across their business. So it's, it's, it's very comprehensive across all of the ES and G areas. Uh, and I think that's, uh, it's taken a lot of work, but it's, it's very, uh, very impressive to see. Great. Charlene, final point of the day. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's, there's, there's just too many. So I've just got to quickly run through just a couple and they're mostly sort of on the retail investment side. So Lion Trust are incredible. They're super transparent, open to new ways of communicating and do ESG and sustainability really, really well, better than most. Ticker is an online platform for people with smaller amounts of money and they communicate, they're just brilliant, they're leaders. And um, I just want to um, big up Pension B for launching 
um, a fossil free pension option for their customers. And other than that, I just think there are just so many different pros and cons in the larger sort of institutional firms. So it's kind of hard to, to pick out one. But I always look for B Cup. B Corp certification, a net zero commitment, and a serious gender and, and race policy to see how progressive a company is. Ladies, thank you so much for today. Thank you for joining the panel. And thanks to all the attendees who came along this morning. As I say, I, we have made a recording of this. So if you'd like us to share it with you, please do get in touch and follow up with myself directly. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you.